Gary Breen is with us. Good morning to you, Gary. How are you doing? Very well. Good morning, guys. That's an interesting enough stat that um, we're looking at 1990-91, uh, the last time that we had as many teams unbeaten at this point. That was a pretty exciting denouement to the end of the 1990-91 season. Yeah, listen, I, I, it's it's quite interesting looking at As a player in the Premier League who have been playing for those lesser teams, I always felt we would always go after the bigger teams. And it, you do feel now that the teams now are a little bit subservient, damage limitation. We've obviously seen Rafa Benitez, Newcastle doing that, setting up that way. And it's frustrating, really, because the competitiveness of the Premier League is something that the world has admired, that the bottom teams come on the day, beat the top teams in stark contrast to, say, like La Liga as such. But uh, it's frustrating to see that stat come out. The, um, one of the other things I wanted to, to generally talk about was the, um, that separation that Owen was talking about. It's, it's happening a, a little bit at the bottom as well, that... Um, the the really bad teams are getting cut adrift a little bit earlier in the mm. season here. We're looking at Huddersfield of three points, Newcastle of three points, and then Fulham and Cardiff of five points. Then there's a tiny bit of a gap to Southampton and Burnley. But it just feels as if um, there are very good teams and there are some very bad teams. And that kind of evening off of standards that we've seen in recent seasons isn't going to happen this year. No, I'd agree. I think, I think what we're seeing with Manchester City, certainly under Pep Guardiola, is an exceptional team. And of course, Liverpool... Of producing something of their best, but you're right. I think some of the the, the the teams under the top six, I think the level of quality has dropped in the Premier League. I'm, I've no doubt about that. You look at the likes of Huddersfield; they just can't score, and if, if that's the case, you're never going to survive in the Premier League. And I think, I think more often than not now, it's just about clubs as such getting into the Premier League initially, and then probably having to take a step back, go back into the Championship. But they've got all the Premier League money to consolidate and come back again a lot stronger. And I think. That's something that we saw with Burnley. They were the ones who were able to do that and they've gone on from strength to strength. I know they're having their struggles here at the moment, but I don't see that going on for particularly a long time this season. When you, when you talk about that exceptional Manchester City team, I think obviously the conversation will probably have it if, if they go back to back about them once again potentially being the greatest Premier League team of all time. You don't wonder, looking at uh, Liverpool's early season form, if they don't win the Premier League this season, if they are the best Premier League side to not win a Premier League title. Is that getting ahead of ourselves too much in terms of how good the top three is? Well, I think you... Uh, I, I look at it, certainly, Manchester City against Liverpool. I, I still think, as, as well as Sarri's done with Chelsea, they're a work in progress, certainly defensively. I know Hazard elevates that team. But this Manchester City team is exceptional. And it, even I mean, when you make that comparison to, those, to the great Premier League teams, which... Unfortunately, or fortunately, but it felt unfortunately at the time I played against the um, the Arsenal team, the the treble winning United team, Jose Mourinho's first um, Chelsea team as well. Really top teams, and if you look at it, I think a lot of those players will probably get in a starting eleven ahead of this Manchester City, and that's why it's incredible the body of work that Pep Guardiola has done because he's getting players that are, to do things you would never normally associate. The very fact that Manchester City are so good at winning the ball back, and it's not as if they've got a Vieira, a Keane, a, a snarling central midfielder ball winner who does it. It's David Silva who's doing it. It's Kevin De Bruyne. It's Sterling. They, they're kind of picking the pockets of the, of the opposition. And it's so difficult to even get a strike on goal against Manchester City. Why? Well, like, what, what is it that Guardiola's doing that's able to make these players perform like that? It's brilliant, it, it, and it's gone under the radar, to my frustration in, anyway, as, as someone who admires defensive play. He's such a brilliant defensive coach, and everyone talks about how good these teams are going forward, but it's no coincidence, in all these 10 seasons, I think he's, his team's had, in nine of the 10 seasons as a manager, they've had the best defensive record. I know people say, well, you've got the best players, but it's more than that. He's getting players to do things that are so alien to him, and is you're in opposition, because you, you're, you're fatigued in terms of how much they control possession, invariably when you get the ball back and you get your head up to make a pass, you can't. You can't even get in their half, it seems. And I, I, I just think that they're just going to go to another level. I know we talked about how well Jurgen Klopp has recruited with Liverpool and, and how good they look, but I just don't see anyone bridging the gap to Manchester City. I really don't. And it, it, the frustration is, is that I look at their back four and it's not a case of them being a brilliant defenders because all of that back four that played last night, all their strengths are going forward. They're not defensively. And we probably think, well, listen, you can get at them as such, but you can't because you couldn't get at um, Yara Torre. You couldn't get at Mascarano when they were playing centre-half at Barcelona. You just, don't, you just don't have the ball. And that's not, that's not, you know, a fluke. It's by design. It's by coaching. It's by being in the right place. It's by attacking with the ball so that as soon as you lose it, you can get it back straight away. And, and, and he is just an absolute genius of a coach. 
We were having a conversation last week and there was some suggestion that there perhaps isn't enough nasty individuals in this current Manchester City team and that might be the one thing stopping them going from back to back that kind of very uh, like large level of ruthlessness perhaps doesn't exist in the side. I'm not so sure about that. I, I think Fernandinho is uh, the one nasty individual that Manchester City certainly have and I think his performance last night was outstanding despite showing the hallmarks, despite not showing the hallmarks I should say of, uh, of nastiness that we perhaps uh, want to see from this Manchester City team. Well, they're professional, they're subtle. This is the thing you don't think is particularly bad. It's not crunching tackles, it's little pull of jerseys, it's mm. little blocking people. And you, you'll see if you watch Manchester City play that they commit so many fouls. And it's no surprise to expect Guardiola's Barcelona teams and, 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 and obviously the iconic Spanish teams who have won so many trophies in terms of the national team. They were brilliant at it. Just little fouls here, the dark arts, and they do it brilliantly well, Manchester City. It goes underneath the radar. You, As soon as you look to break, they stop it. Little foul, little pull of the shirt, little trip. They don't look particularly mean as such. Then they pick them up and say, sorry, and they look at the referee and go, oh, it's an accident. And they don't get booked. It's just... They're, they're so, there's, there's so much to admire about this Manchester City team. Where does that culture come from? Who teaches, like, because you don't... Spanish. It's the Spanish culture. It's from the manager, without a shadow of a doubt. Because you weren't seeing any of these Manchester City doing it under the snarling Roberto Mancini, were you, as such? And how demonstrative he was on the sidelines. But it's just, t it's just so subtle. It's little, like, pulls of the arm that stops you in the tracks, just allows... And it, and it comes, if you when, when you're a player and you're playing against Spanish teams or the Spanish national team, they're brilliant at it. They barely touch you, but it's enough to knock you off your stride. And you look around at the ref and say, he stopped me. And he went, oh, it wasn't too bad, was it? And we're tearing into people, trying to cut people in half. Going into books, getting sent off. It's, it, it, it's, he, he's brilliant, Guardiola. I mean, I'm going to wax lyrical about him all day long, you could, but he, he's just been unbelievable. And this is the problem that not only Mourinho faces in his, in his own city in Manchester, but the Premier League and, and I'd hazard a guess or Europe now because this looks like the start of a real a dynasty a dynasty or whatever of football there. I, I think it bodes so well for City, so difficult for their opponents. Yeah, because I mean, the, there was always the suspicion that Guardiola was going to burn out wherever he went, that he had a certain lifespan. And it feels that maybe that was always going to be the case at Barcelona because of the pressures of that job and the mm. kind of identity that he had with it. It also seems like at Bayern, it wasn't a very natural fit. You had all those former players who were so important and who didn't kind of like that style. But here, it doesn't really feel as if there is that same level of pressure or intensity at Manchester City because, I mean, let's face it, the owners, this is a pastime for them. So they're not ringing him up every day going, what the hell's going on? Why are we only winning 1-0 last night in London? They're like, oh, this is... I see what you're doing with our money and it's, well, we're pretty happy with it. So, Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're right there. I think that ultimately, you look at Manchester City and there's no history of winning like there was at Bayern, like there was at Barcelona. And you're right. I think the only fear of burnout will come from Guardiola himself, that he's so intense and that he's demanding all the time. And it, probably he does need a sabbatical just to recharge the batteries. But you would hope that it, that doesn't happen at Manchester City because... There's something special there. And if you were to take him away, with all the money, Joe, that they have, they wouldn't be replicating what they have. It's, it's Guardiola. And I know they've got some special players. Of course they have. But those special players are doing things you would never normally see them do. And they're, all of those players have elevated their game, their quality to another level under Guardiola. Mm. And like it's it's interesting when you look at the hierarchy and you look at some of the boardroom kind of conversations that were shown in the documentary recently. And I think that there is a culture of ruthlessness in that boardroom, and that is a, a culture of winning ultimately in the modern business-oriented world of football. And you do wonder if it's curious chatting about this, given their opponent last night in Tottenham Hotspur, mm. if there is that lack of ruthlessness at the upper echelons of, of that football club. Maurizio Pochettino, of course, uh, at this point, well-reported quotes before the game, saying that it's his worst feeling to a start of a Premier League season. Yeah, I was staggered by that quote. I'd done a piece leading into the weekend saying that Tottenham are at real crossroads. The very fact that they had the best start to their Premier League season, people were asking me, what, what do you mean? And I, I could sense it because I don't think there's more to achieve with this Tottenham team as such. I think over the last three or four seasons, I think they're further away from the Premier League title than they've ever been, despite their start and despite the loss last night. I just feel that Pochettino's probably looking at it and he, he may well be thinking, have I reached a ceiling at Tottenham? Now, it will be an amazing decision for him to leave them just as they're going into this fabulous new stadium but this brilliant new stadium what's it going to mean ultimately to the pitch because it stopped 
them strengthening what has been a brilliant Tottenham team over the last couple of seasons. I talked about timing in football, and I think timing has been cruel on this Tottenham team because at a stage when they were just a couple of signings away from genuinely winning the Premier League, I felt, they had to build this new stadium so the money just wasn't there. And I think that Pochettino is very aware of what people are saying about him now, that he's a fabulous manager, but he's never won anything. I think he went to Southampton and people raised a lot of eyebrows, but he realised straight away that the timing was right to get out of there. He went to Tottenham. And I think the concern now will be that he can't take them to where he wants to be as a manager, and that's winning titles. Yeah, it's hard to see how all of a sudden Daniel Levy decides that he wants to invest 150, 200 million in that team. And because we had Graham Hunter on earlier on, he was saying that like uh, it, it's clear that Pochettino is wanted by Real Madrid, mm. but that Real Madrid would have to pay a bunch of compensation, perhaps up to 15, 20 million to get him out. And that's never happened for a manager before. And there's kind of a, a, a um, not a hatred, but not far off it for Levy for the way that he handled the Gareth Bale negotiations on the part of Real Madrid. So there's tension already within that relationship. So Pochettino's going to have to force it. And I, you know, mm. it's hard. It, it feels like he's trying to manipulate that situation, but it's a long goodbye as opposed to a short goodbye. Yeah, listen, I, in terms of forcing it, Joe, I'm not convinced that he needs to. I don't. I genuinely don't believe that for, for Pochettino, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to manage Real Madrid. I think that job, more or it comes up reasonably regularly, doesn't it, over yeah. a couple of season periods. You don't let so it will it will come round again for him, there's no doubt. And I don't see his stock crashing to such an extent where they wouldn't want to court him again. But I just feel that from a personal level, he must look at the scenario and think because his body of work at Tottenham is absolutely incredible. I talked about Pep Guardiola, what he's done, but I look at what Pochettino has done at Tottenham as well. It's just it's amazing in terms of what he's created there. That young, vibrant team. He's created wealth that Tottenham didn't have. And people say about Harry Kane coming through. Harry Kane wasn't a Robbie Keane. He wasn't a Wayne Rooney. He wasn't Michael Owen, who was destined to be a top player. Pochettino has made him it. And listen, he's got to take a lot of the plaudits in terms of his hard work, Harry Kane. But it was Pochettino who gave him his opportunity that no other manager was. It wasn't as if the Tottenham hierarchy thought that... Hierarchy, I can barely say it there. Thought that they had a brilliant player coming through because they didn't. He was loaned out to all the lower league clubs. And he's done it so often. Deli Alley for £5 million. And... And even the players that you did have that they spent money on, the likes of Ericsson, Vertonghen, and Alderweireld, they've, they've just gone to another level under him. So I think he'll look at that and just he'll probably think, I don't think I can do any more with this team. And that's that's the real worry for Daniel Levy, for all the Tottenham supporters, because if he's to leave Tottenham now, now it's an absolute disaster. I've said it before, there's some, some shocking things in the Premier League, the likes of Sol Campbell defecting to go to Arsenal. I think it's just surpassed that. Because Tottenham look, with a new stadium, with this young team, they're on the cusp of something. If he goes, it will fall down. Gary, great stuff. Thanks a million for joining us this morning.